What's going on guys? Today we're talking about overrated tractor features. Yeah, there's a lot of them. So this is just my opinion, okay? And so you're gonna have a different opinion, believe it or not. However, I'm curious to know how many of these we share in common and how many you think are valuable and I think are simply overrated. So make sure you leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts. And while you're at it, make sure you follow along, okay? Hit that subscribe button below, go to Facebook, like it on there, Instagram, you can follow me there too. Really appreciate your support. You guys make this a lot of fun. Let's get into it. My poor clock. It's working, but if I have it on, it's got a really loud grinding or whining noise of some kind. I need to take it in and get that fixed. Okay, so we have a lot of items to cover in this on the overrated list for these tractors. We're gonna go from the least overrated. We'll have that last one, the grand finale, be the most overrated, okay? So pay attention, watch them all. Your ranking's gonna be different. You're gonna have some items that are on here, some that are not interchangeable, all that kind of stuff, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, first up, guess what it is? I'm sitting on it. It's these R4 tires, okay? This tread pattern, not tires in general but the R4 industrial tread pattern. Yeah, it's overrated, okay? So over the last 15, 20 years, that's when these tires have really become super popular, okay? And with good reason. They're very versatile, very good on different applications. They wear very well. They've got a lot of good things about them. I totally get it, totally agree. However, anytime I get a tractor in that does not have this style of tire on it, boy, it takes longer to sell. People want to negotiate or ask how much it is for a different set of tires, a set of R4 tires on there instead. It's just amazing. And to me, R4 tires, yes, they're good in applications, but they are um, sacrificing effectiveness because of that ability. You know, So they're a hybrid, right? They're designed to wear very well. They're designed to um, perform well in, in a multitude of situations you know whether it's snow ice mud grass all that kind of stuff so they're not great at any particular thing other than wearing very well they are not superior on snow and ice they're in fact in my opinion subpar uh, in mud they are pretty good but they're not nearly as good as an ag tire on turf yeah they're good on turf i do drive them a lot on my on my lawn at home whether it's a little 1025r or a big four series like this however Turf tires are superior, okay? So there's something superior no matter what situation you're in. So these are good all around tires, but you know, I actually recently was trying to plow my driveway with this tractor here. Couldn't maintain traction for the life of me. It was terrible. And so even with this huge heavy tractor here, all that ballast weight, everything else, it was just a tough spot. So for snow and ice, I'd rather have one of these sets right here, the Carlisle VersaTurf or a set of HDAPs over something like this every time. And you can't get these for tractors this size, but there's other tires like the Nokian tires and some others out there that perform a lot better in slippery situations. So they make the list because they're simply overrated in the fact that I think the whole subcompact and compact tractor world is so focused and so um, accustomed to seeing R4 tires on their tractors that they discount every other type of tire that's out there. And you need to take a harder look at those because they're great for a lot of applications. Single point hydraulic connections are overrated guys, but that doesn't mean they aren't cool. It's just that I don't really know if they're that necessary. Really, how hard is it to just disconnect four quick couplers? So I totally get that it's cool and I love cool stuff, you know, and in fact, I think the single point hydraulic connection is awesome. Okay, so that's a bit of a contradiction there. I'm full of contradictions and it's okay. Have you seen the dual tires at my 1025 R? I don't know how practical it is, but it's super cool. But the point being is that when I wanted to add a single point hydraulic connection to one of the tractors that I had in the past, I got a quote and it was around $1,000. Yes, $1,000 to add on. This feature right here, this single point hydraulic connection, really $1,000 just so I can pull one lever instead of disconnecting four individual couplers, a thousand bucks. I don't know, I'm just saying, I think that's overrated. But let's take a quick moment here and talk about Kubota's single point hydraulic connection. As far as I know, it's just included in the price on the new BX series if you get the loader, okay? There's not really an option to not get it. If there is, I haven't seen it because every single new style Kubota BX that I've seen has this single point connection here, okay? And so that's included in the price. However, it may be included in the price, but there's still a cost to account for that. 
And is it really worth it? Again, we're talking about four quick disconnect couplers, the Pioneer, the Ag style couplers. It's not hard to do that, guys. So that's why it's overrated. Skid steer quick attach buckets. My goodness, am I tired of hearing about how SSQA is superior to JDQA or to anything else. No, it's not cheaper than JDQA. JDQA attachments are the same price as SSQA. I can prove it to you because I sell them all the time. And look, it's on John Deere as well, okay? And it's a good system, I'm not gonna knock it. But is it superior? The only valid argument I can hear for this is that there's more used attachments out there, or maybe there's more neighbors down the street that would have SSQA versus JDQA attachments sitting around. However, this is my tractor here, John Deere, has the skid steer quick attach on it. It came this way. I bought it used. And I'm really considering getting an adapter to go from the SSQA to the JDQA. Reason being, I think they're just easier to attach. It's a lot easier for me to just line up to the JDQA and hook up and go versus the skid steer quick attach. It's not difficult, it's just not as simple of a process. For this one here, guys, we're talking cruise control. It's overrated. The only time I ever use cruise control is if I'm going from my house to the shop or the shop to the house. And do I need to use it? Not really. I'm just using it, I guess, just to validate the stupid option's existence. Guys say they want this option for their hydro tractors when they're doing field work. You know, they're tilling, they're brush hogging, that kind of thing. For me, I never use cruise control when I'm in a field. There's too many bumps, undulations, things I need to go around. I need to change direction. I need to change speed. I need to account for something on a constant basis. And so my speed is constantly changing. This is not a crop field. You know, and I'm not planting corn or soybeans. And if you were, typically you're going to be in an ag tractor, you know, a 100 horse or 200 horse tractor that's gear drive anyway, and can go that constant speed just by going into gear. But I'm telling you, cruise control for me is one of the most overrated things. And really, a lot of tractors just come with it. It's not an option, but if you're looking at a tractor and you really think you need cruise control, I would encourage you to second guess that because you could open up more options for yourself. Now, this is a very basic cruise control here. You know, there's a more advanced one that's on the 3R and the 4R tractors and some others out there as well, which means you can set it with the push of a button and you can increase and decrease your speed with the push of a button, that kind of thing as well. That's pretty cool. However, it's not all that practical. I mean, how often do you need cruise control on a tractor? Next up, we're talking about locking rear differential. What an overrated item. Unfortunately, this one's pretty much standard on any tractor you're gonna get. Oh, there it is. Sorry guys, it was hiding. Push it down with your heel. It's gonna lock that rear axle and provide traction to both rear wheels. Seems like that's a pretty handy feature to have. However, almost every subcompact and compact tractor on the market happens to have this handy feature called four-wheel drive or front-wheel assist. So if you need extra traction, you're gonna use four-wheel drive. You're gonna use front-wheel assist. I've used locking rear differential on principle, thinking it's really going to make a significant difference. However, it does not. I mean, I have totally tested this out in my driveway. I've got a treacherous driveway in the wintertime, going uphill, when it's icy, snow conditions. I've tried just using the locking rear differential. I've tried just using four-wheel drive. I've tried using four-wheel drive and locking rear differential. It just doesn't make a difference. And in fact, if it does, it's so minuscule that it's just not worth having on a tractor. Four-wheel drive, front-wheel assist, that makes the significant difference. This does not. It's overrated, guys. You know what else is overrated? Pre-emissions. These are not diesel trucks. It's not construction equipment. Very simple here in the subcompact and compact tractor world. Nothing to be scared of except for this word of advice. Stay away from the B3350. Yeah, the Kubota B3350. Do not buy it. Supposedly the new B3350s are fixed. However, Kubota wouldn't stand behind all the issues they had with the B3350. I know of a lot of customers, in fact, one of them encouraged me repeatedly to save his information because he sued Kubota and wanted to file a class action lawsuit. He did get a full refund after he finally went to great lengths to do so. Do not buy a B3350. Besides that, pre-emissions, it really doesn't matter. So what's an emissions tractor? It's something that has one of these guys on it, okay? This is a regen system, tier four compliance for machines that are 26 horsepower and up. 
need to have something like this that were produced, I don't know, after 2012, 2011. The date is kind of arbitrary because it kind of rolled out in that time frame. However, there's a 2016 John Deere 2032R model. I have one right now that does not have tier four emissions. It does not have a regen system on it. So there must have been a, a rollout or an agreement in place when they upgraded a model or came out with a new model, then they had to implement the tier four. I don't know exactly, but that's all I can assume. You can still use the tractor while it's doing its thing. It's simply going to instruct you by way of the dash typically or a little icon on there that says you need to increase your RPM. You can still use the equipment while it's going through the regen process, which takes, it depends. Some of them take 20 minutes or a half hour. Some of them take an hour to two hours. My 4066R took almost two hours the last time that it went through regen. The 3901, the Kubota L3901 I have over there took about 20 minutes to go through regen. It varies. Your tractor will tell you what you need to do, which is simply increase the RPMs. For John Deere, typically that's 1500 RPMs minimum. And once you go above that with the throttle, and even if you go back down underneath, it won't go below 1500 RPM. With the Kubota that I did recently, I had to put it to full throttle in order for it to do the regen process. This is basically a big collection box and it's just burning off that soot, burning off that build up here periodically. The stuff that doesn't burn off on its own as you're using it in operation, is what's going to be collected in here and then burned off when you get that heat generated once you go above a certain rpm level so tier 4 emissions is really nothing to be concerned about this is not like what you would have on your diesel truck or on some of the other construction equipment out there semis that kind of thing that really you had a lot of issues with this is very non-invasive the biggest downside really is that it's a big hunk here and this is material and so it's going to drive up the cost of your machine for me, that's the biggest downside to the tier four is it's just gonna be increasing your cost of your machine. So pre-emissions, it's nice, but it's overrated. You're getting a two for one in this one. Yeah, two things related to loaders, all right? First, quick park loaders, they're overrated. Well, sorta, okay? Here's why, on smaller tractors with belly mowers on them or with front mount snow blowers, tractors that have a mid PTO, I can see where there's value in that. You gotta be able to take that loader on and off quickly there. You don't wanna mow with your loader on. You don't wanna, you can't have a, have a, a loader on if you wanna use your snowblower on the front, okay? Totally get that, all right? However, when you get up to the three and the four series in the compact tractor world, it's really not that big of a deal if the loader comes on and off or not. Very few three series tractors are gonna have a front mount snowblower, okay? I mean, a fraction of the overall population of three series tractors. In four series, it's basically non-existent anymore. And those that are running a front mount snowblower are running it on the loader. So really, you're paying engineering costs, you're paying additional design costs, material costs, all that kind of thing for something in a quick park design that you're just never gonna use. You're never gonna realize that benefit. So I've been using three and four series tractors for a long time. And you know what? The only time my loader ever comes off is if I'm making a video or if I'm doing a demonstration. Other than that, my loader's on my tractor all the time. I know some of you, even on those bigger tractors, the three and the four series, have a reason to take your loader off. However, it is overrated because most of us do not, and you're paying more for that option to take it off. Oh wow, boy, this is comfortable. This loader joystick location, wow, I can't imagine it being like right here. Please, you're telling me from here to here makes that big of a difference? You know, I use the 3E series for a lot of work in the past. That loader's up here somewhere, you know. That's never an issue to me. I mean, come on, give me a break, guys. I mean, really? Operator fatigue? You're gonna have that much more operator fatigue being right here versus right here? I mean, it's nice, and I get that you have to do something to make it different, make it premium or superior or whatever versus the value series. However, it's really not that big of a deal, you know? So whatever, overrated. Let's go take a look at a value series so you can see the difference. Okay, so 4044M, value series. Here is your loader joystick location. Here's the fender, okay, here's the fender. So this is the same fender if it was a 4R series, the deluxe series, okay? So they would position that loader joystick somewhere coming off of or mounted in here, depending if it's an open station or a cab. So it'd be right in this general vicinity, right in here. And so we're talking, you know, three, four inches here of difference. This is totally comfortable, totally doable. It's really not a big deal. This right here is a fixed loader, okay? It is not quick parked. They make a version in the 4R series. This is the 4M series, but the R, the premium deluxe, that's, I don't know, 
1500 bucks more that is quick park come on guys leave your loader on if you need to take your bucket off and on that note that's the more important thing you want a quick attach bucket that's the big deal quick park loader not so much unless you have one of the smaller tractors with a mower deck on it or a front mount snowblower then i can understand it otherwise guess what it's overrated so this one here this little button here you'll see this on a lot of tractors something similar to this whether it's john deere kubota or something else a lot of the premium tractors okay e-throttle auto throttle one of those things one of those terms it could be called something different depending on your tractor but essentially what it does is let it act more like an automobile okay and so even if your throttle control is all the way in the idle position as you step on your forward or reverse pedals for your hydrostatic transmission it's going to increase the engine rpm cool in theory right we're getting more like automobiles these things are getting so advanced pretty sweet however in reality i almost never use it and i find it to be more of a nuisance than anything else i do get it in theory though if you want to use this for loader work for instance the manual will typically suggest that you put it in the midpoint on the rpm scale okay for the throttle so put it somewhere right in the middle that way it's not at a complete idle and you don't have those huge swings those huge variations in rpms so it's kind of in the middle there and then when you need it and you're pushing the pedal beyond that midpoint the rpms it's going to increase and give you more power more hydraulic flow more speed whatever you need it's going to give it to you and then when you let off the pedal it's going to go back down to that midpoint in the rpms again sounds kind of cool really i find it more annoying than anything else and you know what i just really don't use it again though on most of your premium on most of your deluxe types of tractors and the three series four series this happens to be actually an option that's found on the new 2r series this is a 2032r it's just going to be i think standard equipment at least for the 3r and the 4r maybe it's an option on the 2r i don't know for sure but the 3R and the 4R and Kubota as well, it's pretty much standard equipment on those larger series. It's just one of those options that drives the cost up and I would happily live without it if I can get it for a cheaper price point. You just don't always have that option. So it's overrated. So this one here, it's, it's my favorite overrated, all right? And I get flack for it every time I talk about it. I get it, I totally get it. However, metal on tractors? Man, this stuff is overrated. Plastic is where it's at. I'm serious. I'm 100% serious. These steel panels on tractors, man, they're just overrated. Come on, guys. Plastics are not all the same. These things are advancing at a rapid pace. It's just incredible the technology that's out there and the advancement that these polymers are having, okay? These things are super superior to steel, like the steel you would find on the older John Deere's and on the Kubota's. It's just no doubt about it. Sure, you can break it. The same way you can break steel, okay? I mean, these things are rugged, they're rigid, they hold their color, they hold their shape, they rebound, it doesn't matter. They're awesome. And I'm telling you, give it time, maybe you're the next generation, okay? Maybe, maybe not our generation, but the next generation is going to really fully understand that concept that there's advancement in this type of material here that is not being made in steel, at least at a reasonable price point okay this is gonna be the way of the future and i believe kubota will go this way as well eventually so when i talk about steel being overrated i'm not talking about for buckets or for your mower decks or for the axle or the frame that kind of thing i'm talking about those exterior panels on your fenders on the hood that kind of thing okay i live in a world of used tractors so i see hundreds of tractors here at my shop that have been in the real world that come into me as trade-ins okay and i see tenfold that amount through pictures that are sent to me so i have a what i feel like a pretty good handle on what steel can handle <laughs> so to speak and what plastic can handle i'm telling you it's very very rare even on low hour kubota tractors or low hour john deere tractors that have metal hoods on them for instance to not have some kind of damage that cannot be removed okay there's typically always a dent or a big scuff mark that's kind of creased into the steel in there, you can't do anything about it, okay? And lots of times if that goes through the paint, it's gonna corrode, unless you put some touch-up paint on there, it looks really stupid, okay? With the polymer panels on the John Deere tractors, I can buff out just about anything out of there and make it look almost brand new. So some of my favorite arguments about steel being superior to plastic is, well, if something falls on your hood, it's just gonna break that plastic hood 
and on a steel hood, just take a hammer and pound it out. Okay, so two things about that. One, you're not pounding anything out. It's still gonna be a dent, it's probably gonna look worse. Two, I dropped a five inch diameter tree onto my plastic hood. And you know what happened? I had to search and search and search to find the mark that it left. It was so tiny. It was basically not even there. So you know what? Drop a five inch tree on your steel hood and it's gonna be a dent there that you pound out and it never looks the same again. So another argument about steel being superior to plastic revolves around being brittle in cold temperatures. And that's really a thing of the past. So there's two videos out there. Yeah, one of them is by John Deere and the other one is an independent video as far as I can tell. A guy takes a bowling ball from a loader. He puts two bowling balls side by side. He has a Kubota steel hood and a John Deere plastic hood side by side. And he just tips the loader and drops the bowling balls onto the hoods. And it just bounces off of the John Deere hood while denting the steel hood. So while steel is traditional and I totally get it, plastics are the way of the future. Steel's overrated, guys. Okay, so this next one is definitely overrated, but I don't want anybody questioning my patriotism, okay? I am as patriotic as anybody. So I have a lot of experience, a lot of history working in other industries, in aerospace, in commercial equipment, um, and tractors, you know, among other things. And so it's just that you get to major manufacturers like Kubota, John Deere, even Toro back there, I have a grasshopper back there as well. These big manufacturers are seldom going to be completely manufactured and assembled in one country, okay? It's just, it's just unlikely. You know, in order to be competitive with the competition on cost, you need to consider global manufacturing, you know, global sourcing for components. And so that doesn't mean that you're gonna get every component from China and you're gonna get the cheapest quality and the lowest quality that you can get and assemble your tractor here in the USA and boom, think it's gonna be all hunky-dory. So there's other things besides just where a component is made that you'll wanna consider. You wanna consider design and engineering, for instance. You know, there's a lot of hotspots in the world that are known, that are renowned for engineering. You know, the USA is a really good engineering country, but there's some other places too. Germany, for instance, Japan, top-notch engineers and superior to the US in different industries. And so if you can control the design, control the engineering process of it, and perhaps have engineering or production control and quality control assist different countries in that manufacturing process, you really, even though it's manufactured in another country, a component, whether it's an engine or an axle or a bracket or a gearbox or whatever it might be, you still have control over the process. And so yes, it may come from China or it may come from Mexico or somewhere else. However, there's a big difference if you compare that against just a, a Chinese manufacturer that doesn't have that type of quality and production control, that doesn't have oversight by a company like John Deere, Kubota, Toro, or any other industry, name, name your manufacturer, okay? So I say all this stuff because it's too easy to put things in a box and think it's gonna be neat and tidy. And it's just really not that way anymore. We don't live in a world that's like that and I don't think we ever will again. Just my opinion, you need to have a more sophisticated understanding that all these manufacturers, these major manufacturers, are going to be sourcing components from other locations. And the reason for that is primarily cost. Because if you only chose to build a tractor or a machine that was very complex, required hundreds if not thousands of components, and you only sourced that from the USA, the cost would be so astronomically high that nobody would buy it, okay? Even the people that are diehard made in the USA people just simply wouldn't buy it because it would be so expensive. It just wouldn't make sense. So you just gotta look at it realistically, all right? I'm totally on board with made in the USA when possible, when realistic and when feasible. You know, so if you buy that tractor that has foreign components in it, whether it's John Deere, Kubota, whoever, you know, you're still supporting the local dealers here, the people that work there with buying parts and service and gear and whatever else. In a way, you're supporting me, okay? You're supporting me through the attachments and accessories that you buy, through the used tractors that you buy. By watching this video, you're supporting me, somebody in the US here, okay? So I'm just saying there's a lot of ways to slice it and think outside the box. So made in the USA. Overrated. Guys, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but tractor backhoes, guess what? They're overrated. Yeah, there's a handful of folks out there that need a backhoe, that have an ongoing need, a requirement of a backhoe. Perhaps commercial operations, perhaps large farmsteads that have a lot of tasks for them. 
However, most folks have one, maybe two projects in mind when they think they need a backhoe. And that's great because the backhoe is a very handy tool. It has its place as do many other attachments. The problem is it's a very expensive attachment. It's one of the most expensive attachments that you can purchase. So a lot of folks buy a backhoe and they have one or two projects in mind. They think it's a requirement for that. You know, unfortunately, the backhoe is one of the most expensive attachments that you can get. And if you're looking to accomplish one or two projects with that backhoe, is that really a good use of money? I would argue that it's not. And the reason is, is because what are you going to do with this backhoe when you don't need it? Okay. You can take a bath on it if you want to sell it in the used market. And a lot of the backhoes have a subframe on them. They have additional power beyond hydraulics that are tied into the tractor. And some of them, you know, this one has its own seat, but some of them require the operator seat here, which, which swivel around. So there's a lot of other little components that go into it. You're not going to get nearly what you think you are out of a used backhoe. Okay. Or the flip side of that, you've got a huge attachment that's worth a lot of money sitting in your yard, getting sun faded or whatever else, not getting used. That's a bunch of money that's tied up as well. So in my opinion, it's just not a good use of money unless you have an ongoing need for it. So what would I do in that situation? I would rent a mini excavator. Why? So it's going to cost you a lot less money, that's for sure. Even if you think about it this way, the amount of depreciation you're going to lose on the backhoe itself, or if you try to sell it, that difference between what you bought it for and what you can actually get for it on the used market, that's going to be a significant difference there, okay? I don't care if it's John Deere, Kubota, Massey, Coyote, LS, I don't care what the manufacturer is. Backhoes just are not going to hold their value as well as the rest of the tractor. So if you consider that loss, that amount of money that is lost by depreciation, instead you can use that when you want to, that amount of money right there, to rent a mini excavator for two or three projects, okay? And you'll still probably come out ahead. Mini excavators are going to be a lot more efficient, okay? So with a tractor, you've got the operator station over here if you want to move the machine around. So you have to raise up the stabilizer bars, you have to raise up the bucket, obviously the backhoe as well, and then go move the machine around to the next location you want to be at, and then restart that process, set everything back up. With a mini excavator, or an excavator, doesn't really matter, you're sitting in the operator seat that controls both the backhoe as well as the movement of the machine. And so you're right here, you're set up, you're ready to go. So you can get from point A to point B a lot quicker, you can accomplish your work a lot quicker, and it's just gonna be a more efficient process that way as well. Uh, well then answer me this, Courtney. Why do you carry tractors with backhoes on them? Well, obviously, it's because people don't listen to me. They do what they want. <laughs> and that's okay, because so do I. All I'm saying is that from a practicality standpoint, backhoes are overrated. But if you want one, just get the stinking thing. Tractor horsepower is overrated. Did you guys know that? Yeah, it really is. Did you know that every tractor in here can come in a 25 horsepower variation. So one of the things that I'm told a lot is, hey, I need a 25 horsepower tractor, or I need a 35 horsepower tractor, or I need a 40 horsepower tractor, or a 30 horsepower tractor, whatever it is. That's just one piece of the puzzle. So if we're talking about horsepower, say it's a 25 horsepower tractor. I can nominally now, nominal horsepower here, 25 horsepower, 1025R, the 2025R, and the 3025E. In Kubota, it'd be the BX2680, the B2650, and the L2501. There's huge changes dimensionally with the width and the length, tire size, frame size, tractor weight, hydraulic system, loaders, three-point, all that kind of stuff. So don't worry about horsepower. It's really not a big deal. You need to focus more on what the tasks are that you want to accomplish and then let that lead you to the correct tractor for you. So in that sense, guys, horsepower is overrated. All right, guys, so that completes the list. So I am curious to know what you guys thought about that. Again, my opinion, okay, this is my list. Make your own list if you want. Don't get mad at me, don't call me an idiot. Just tell me what you would change, what you'd replace, what you like that I don't like. It's okay, we all have our own opinions and it's not that big of a deal. Again, I wanna hear your feedback, so leave a comment below. If you haven't done so, hit that subscribe button. A lot of great videos all the time for you. Share them with your friends, put them on forums, head to my website, goodworkstractors.com. I can help with a tractor or an attachment, financing and delivery as well. And don't forget, I'm on Facebook, so you can head there and like that. I post stuff on there that's unique and only found there. Same thing with Instagram, go there and follow me on that. So we'll see you soon, thanks for watching, take care.